Given the title of the Sorcerer Killer, the only man who has a victory over Satoru fucking Gojo, ending his streak of being undefeated but changing the world of Jujutsu forever. His name is Toji Fushigoro. Whilst alive, he was labelled as the shame of the reputable Jujutsu family, but Toji was the wielder of the most extraordinary power. It was called Heavenly Restriction. Oh, and uh, by the way, he was also the loving father to Sure <laughs> okay, maybe not. But he does meet Megami once he's 16 years old, when Toji was resurrected. But before diving deep into that story arc, let's begin from the very beginning. Admittedly, Toji loves money more than his son, but his rivalry with Gojo started long, long ago, back when the strongest sorcerer was just a kid. He was described as an irresponsible father, a addict, despicable, and a self-destructive man. But that doesn't stop all these fangirls from simping for him now, does it? And to be honest, every fangirl and fanboy has every right to, as Toji is a very complex character. Earlier in his life, he was actually the total opposite and had a glimpse of happiness before his life turned upside down. It all went downhill for him because he was a victim and a product of Jujutsu society's depraved system. Toji was born into the honorable Zenin clan, one of the three great Jujutsu families, but he was far from benefiting from it. Instead, his birth to Naobito Zenin's older brother, who was most likely the Zenin clan head before him, came at the cost of deep trauma to Toji. Yep, rather than being treated as the son of the leader, he was seen as trash because of his one flaw, heavenly restriction. The clan was extremely extremely unfair to him for having no curse energy along with his reliance on curse weapons to fight, even going as far as tossing him into a pit full of cursed spirits which earned him a permanent scar on his face. However, despite his lack of curse energy, Toji was physically gifted in an unprecedented way. He was the only example of a person where heavenly restriction completely eradicated their curse energy energy instead of just lowering it to normal levels. This meant Toji was literally built different. He was a superhuman with each one of his five senses attuned to the highest degree. Due to this, he could discern curses and jujutsu as if he could actually see them whilst his body also developed resistance to them as well. Since Toji was such a unique example of how humans could stop emitting negative energy to create curses, he attracted the attention of Yuki, the special grade sorcerer who was researching the elimination of cursed spirits. However, this was all lost to the Zenin clan as they believed that if you're not a Jujutsu sorcerer, you're not worthy as a human being. And even though Toji could very well sense curses and fight effectively against sorcerers even without cursed tools, he couldn't exercise cursed spirits and that that's where the problem lies ladies and gentlemen. As a result of this, Toji became totally unstable whilst living in a household full of hatred and ostracization of him. Especially since they all lived in fear that one single moment is all it requires for Toji to decide to kill them all. However, things did get slightly better when he got married and had a kid. The one and only goat, Megami. Megami's mother evidently calmed down Toji, providing him with a place to actually call home as well as acceptance. This is something he had yearned for his entire life. In fact, he himself gave the name Megami to his son, which means blessings, highlighting that Toji was settling down. He felt grateful and happy, even if he was stuck in a clan devoid of humanity. But one faithful day, since this is an anime after all, and you know, MCs having both parents is not allowed, it's an unwritten rule they have to follow, Megami's mother died. This caused Toji's fragile state of mind to shatter, as he decided to renounce the clan just like Maki Zenin did in the future. There was no home or purpose left for them anymore in there. Not only did Toji take Megami with him, but he also went and got married 
married again, taking on his wife's surname, Fushigoro, to create as much distance as possible between his past and present. The constant abuse and demeaning nature led Toji to feel that he was tainted by the Jujutsu world and worthless by Zenin standards. But this was a laughable notion, as Naoya, the trashiest man of the Zenin clan of all, admits in chapter 151, being a gifted kid blessed with the projection technique, he was called a genius, even predicted to become the clan head after his father, Naobito. His upbringing was, in every way possible, the opposite of Toji. This is why when he first heard of a man without an ounce of cursed energy labelled the black sheep of the Zenin clan, Naoya rushed to see how awful Toji must feel and seem. But he was shocked because Toji was him. He was in the same league as Satoru freaking Gojo. What? Yeah, Toji was rightfully the pinnacle of strength, the polar opposite of Gojo, as Naoya also states. It was actually Gojo alone who understood Toji, meeting him with all his powers out of respect for his strength. He even acknowledged Toji's capabilities, something that his clan never did his entire life. As Naoya states, the sin of the insignificant is the ignorance of strength, meaning that the Zenin clan was full of selfish fools who couldn't stand an anomaly like Toji being stronger than them. It was their luck that Toji did not destroy the clan, but instead chose to abandon his name, as Ranta mentioned that the Zenins were still around only because of Toji's whim. Talk about, he's that guy, you know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, or fortunately, history repeats itself, as the clan did not learn from their mistakes with Toji, and piled on the same sick behavior with Maki Zenin, like, you know, holding back her promotion from grade 4 to grade 1 due to their useless pride, and her father going as far as nearly killing Mai and throwing both of them in the cursed pit that Toji was in in the past. But this time round, they weren't as lucky as with Toji, and ended up being completely destroyed, a reputable clan of many centuries being run into the ground by a sorcerer labelled a monkey just like Toji. My man Ogi over here even shot his pants thinking about the parallels between both Monkey and Toji before dying in the most brutal way possible. But like the Joker would say, you get what you're Deserve. Now whilst Maki succeeded in taking her revenge in the future, within the past, the damage to Toji was done. He developed the mentality that he was not deserving or worthy of leading a normal life or fostering a family. He didn't fit in with normal people, but was also too useless for the Jujutsu world. This led to his self-destructive tendencies as he struggled with his identity. Because of this, Toji was unable able to handle himself or money in a responsible manner, forming addictions and a huge lack of empathy or consideration for the people around him. According to him, he had thrown aside petty pride. He chose the path of never being proud of himself or others. Thus, he chose to become a sorcerer killer and uh, yeah, a gigolo. What? Do you guys know what a gigolo is? Yeah, he was jumping from one woman's house to another all for the money. Would you hire him ladies? The ladies watching this video? Let me know in the comments, don't be shy. However, the worst outcome from all of this was Toji becoming an awful father to Megami, where he finds a way to salvage his life that would actually turn out to be a curse for Megami. He approached Naobito and put up an offer to sell Megami for 7 million yen if he gained a technique, and 8 million if it was a family inherited one. In a twisted way, this was Toji's thought of giving Megami somewhere he had a chance to prosper. Unlike himself, who was hated by the clan, he probably thought that Megami would be treated like Naoya, given a ton of special treatment because of his talents. In reality though, Megami was Toji's trump card, the biggest f**k you that he used against the Zenin clan, because he actually developed the most overpowered turn shadows technique. A power that Gojo himself admits could even rival his own if it's honed correctly, which pssst, 
Sukuna does. No, 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 no. However, even meeting Sumiki's mother didn't change anything for Toji, as he took on assassination work until he and later Sumiki's mother both disappeared from their kids' lives. Toji even forgot who Megumi was when Shiyu asked him, but in his somewhat peaceful life, Toji had a nagging itch from a very long time ago that he just couldn't resist and that was Satoru Gojo. As a parallel to Naoya's curiosity, Toji was so curious about what all the fuss was about this Gojo kid with the six eyes. And this encounter was the shot of a lifetime as it was the first and last time anyone was aware of his presence when he was standing behind them. This is where he had begun a suicide mission that would inevitably alter Jutsu society forever. In fact, the entire world, Toji took on the assassination of Riko Amanai, the Star Plasma Vessel candidate for Tengen's merger. This was a job request from the Star Religious Group or the Time Vessel Association, a group of non-cursed users who worshipped Tengen and wanted her to ascend into her pure form. Later on, we learn this was all part of Kenjaku's plan, the evil brain that has taken over Geto's body. He wants Master Tengen to come closer to becoming a cursed spirit so he can perform a merger with everyone in the world to guess what? What do villains want to do? He wants to destroy the entire planet. What did he say? But if you want me to cover this part of the story in a future video, or let's say Power Scale told you for Shigoro on how strong he actually is, is, make sure to hit the notification bell and like the video. So as you can probably tell, it was none other than Gojo and his best friend Geto, the two strongest sorcerers escorting Riko, where Toji jumped right into it. He came up with a meticulous plan to kill Gojo. Toji wanted to thoroughly weaken him by using other assassins and attackers to keep Gojo and Geto constantly on guard through their techniques. All the while, he prepared a surprise attack on them as soon as they were complacent on the day of the merger. As soon as Gojo stopped his technique out of sheer exhaustion, Toji went ballistic, stabbing him with a sword and forcing Gojo and Geto to separate. Not only did Toji almost send Gojo to his deathbed, he also managed to kill Riko and Kuroi, incapacitating Geto at the same time. In his own words, you guys, with all your blessed talents, lost to a monkey like me who can't even use jujutsu. Toji and Gojo's relationship has strong parallels to Sun Wukong and Buddha. Sun Wukong, better known as the Monkey King, was a trickster set on disrupting the order of the heavens that is Buddha himself. So just like the Chinese tale, Toji had successfully achieved his mission and defeated the strongest duo of the Jujutsu world through pure skill and luck. Oddly, using the word blessing made Toji remember his son, mentioning that he was the one who gave it to him. That was enough sentimental value from him however, as he dumped Riko's body at the Star Religious Headquarters to get his payment and be on his way. Uh... No 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 no, Satoru freaking Gojo had returned from death as the strongest Jujutsu sorcerer. It was at this moment he knew. He whacked up. On the verge of death, Gojo unlocked a whole new power, the secret of the reverse curse technique. Until that point, Gojo couldn't perform it, thus having no way to heal himself. But Toji stabbing him fatally made Gojo concentrate all his attention and energy on understanding the core of curse energy, making him the enlightened being of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is the invincible Gojo Satoru we know in the present day. Against such a force, even Toji who had just mocked Gojo and Geto about losing to a monkey felt a deep uneasiness. An uneasiness he couldn't shake off no matter how hard he tried. And who can blame him? He had just become the target of the man who would become the goat of Jujutsu sorcery. Despite that feeling, Toji told himself that he would win. But just having this thought was what would get him killed. Gojo literally one-shot him by unleashing a technique that not even a lot of people in the Gojo clan know. Hollow Purple. 
Emoji was reduced to nothing within the blink of an eye. In his last moments, his unresolved inferiority complex that influences his destructive behavior resurfaced. He thought to himself how he wanted to discredit the power he saw before him, to entirely crush both the pinnacle of the Jiu-Jitsu world and the Zenin family itself. He wanted this for his self-affirmation, which caused him to deviate from his true self, linking back to how important self is in Jujutsu Kaisen. Toji let his emotional need to prove himself overrun his logical thinking when he had nothing to prove to nobody, just like Gojo. But even at this time, Toji's thoughts drift back to Megami, who was going to get sold. He informs Gojo about it and asks him to do whatever he wants with that information. There's no doubt that such an incapable person as Toji was not fit to be a father. But since Gojo understood Toji in a way no one else could, he intervened in Megami's life, saving him and his foster sister Sumiki from the atrocities of the Zenin clan. After all, Gojo knew all too well how corrupt and immoral clans could be, as he himself experienced it in his entire life. He was targeted, protected, hated and cherished in equal moments since childhood. This was the end of Toji Fuchigoro. Or was it? Oh hell no! My girl Toji was not one to just die with simply one death and it was in the Shibuya incident that he came back alive again, wreaking absolute havoc. Ogami, a cursed user who was hired by Kenjaku, okay. revived Toji using her seance technique on her grandson. This allowed her to summon the body or soul of a dead person and use their technique and physical capabilities. But rather than the grandson being in control of Toji's insane physical prowess, Toji comes back alive due to his heavenly restriction and special soul. His body overrode the technique's effects, making him take over the body in its full capacity. However, this Toji was more like a berserk killing machine through this revival as he aimed to beat the sh out of the strongest person or curse around him. In this state, he entered the domain expansion of Dogon, a special grade cursed spirit who was overwhelming not one, not two, not three, but four sorcerers at once. That's right, Naobito, Nanami, Maki and Megami were all fighting tooth and nail against Dogon, with Megami trying to open a gateway to exit the domain. But here comes Toji, totally annihilating Dogon on with no time. Remember guys, now Beto and Nanami were both special grade 1. Plus there's the others, which showcases Toji's strength being so above all. And once Toji was done with the curse, his next target was Megami. Yeah, this was Akatami's hint at just how broken Megami and his technique could be, as Toji's mindless compass of picking the strongest landed on him. Their fight boils down to hand to and combat, with Megami trying to minimize damage to himself and saving up his Shikigami. Just as he blocks an attack from Toji and misses to hit back because of Toji's crazy speed, he has an intense flashback. He thinks of the specifics of the deal he made with Naobito to sell Megami, wishing for him to have a better life with his massive potential, something he didn't have the luxury of. This was him convincing himself that the clan would treat Megami favorably, despite, you know, being his son. Even if Toji was out of his mind, nothing but a berserk doll, he still remembered his son Megami, though he vowed to not care about anything anymore, right? This proves that deep inside he actually loved his son and could have been a good father, as his memory made him snap out of the technique's effect. However, to confirm his desire, which was for Megami to at least have a life worth living, Toji asked his son, Hey, what's your name? And when Megami replies with Fushigoro, Toji is finally satisfied with the answer that it's not Zeni. It was never a place anyone could have found happiness or home anyway. Even though Toji never had it in him to actually be affectionate to his son in the ways that mattered, the only way he could express himself was violence. He still tried his best to show that he loves Megami both the times he was on the verge of death. After all, 
Koji didn't experience it himself and it warped him into a terrible person but he has the heart enough to know better which proves he has some humanity. In a way he didn't know it but his life had always revolved around Megami coming full circle in his last moments which is why knowing that Megami is free from the Zenin claws Toji destroys himself having the last laugh as he messed with the Jujutsu society and the Zenin clan he hated so much in life and even in death. Now to enjoy more peak fiction why don't you learn about Gojo's relationship with Geto as it is very important to his enlightenment.